Good morning. Right. Let me start by telling you a little something about Dean Mahoney. <laughs> it's a little known fact that he teaches one of the hardest classes in law school. And it's not really about law at all. It's about statistics. It's Dean Mahoney's class on quantitative methods, and I took it, I think, in my second or third year. And it may have been one of the hardest classes I took, at least for those of us who thought that a confidence interval was something that runners did to train for races. <laughs> but it was also one of the best and most useful classes I took in law school. And you'll find that the, law, the classes you'll take here are all the best and most useful. And I actually see Professor Nelson up there in the back. He taught the other hardest class I took in law school. So I'm here today to welcome you to the practice of law. And I guess I'm qualified to do this because, and it's really hard for me to say this, I'm officially in the old lawyer category now. According to the ABA, a young lawyer has no more than seven years out of law school. The realization that I am uh, of a different generation of lawyers came rather abruptly to me a few months ago when we were discussing electric shock therapy in my special education law seminar. So I was trying to introduce a little bit of levity into what's a very serious topic, and I said, remember that episode in Cheers where Cliff hires the behavioral therapist to shock him whenever he says something socially awkward? So, and who remembers that episode? Yeah, see, exactly. <laughs> Blank stares, kind of, kind of like now. So that's what happens when you get old enough to have a different generation of favorite sitcoms. You get to come back and try to remember what it was like to be in your shoes and to try to tell you about how to not make some of the mistakes I made. So I'd like to welcome you to law school with a little story. Um, my husband told me not to tell you this story. He said it was too silly. But he also says I never listened to him. <laughs> so he's right on one count. I was in San Francisco last week uh, for the American Bar Association conference. Um, the first morning I had to go to a session on punishment and policing in schools. The session was about three blocks from my hotel. Three blocks straight up hill. Now normally I'm pretty practical. But I was at a big fancy national conference and so... What are you going to do? You put on your big, fancy high heels. Is anybody here from San Francisco? Yeah. So you can probably guess what happens next. So I had no problem going to the session. On the uphills, the heels actually kind of give you an advantage, levels out the 18% grade. <laughs> the trouble started on the way back down. It was like descending the pyramids on stilts. <laughs> it took me... 20 minutes, no joke, to go about two blocks. And I spent the whole time thinking, if anybody so much as breathes in my direction, I'm going to be uh, tumbling head first all seven blocks down to the BART station. And then I looked around. And I realized, everybody else has already figured this out. I am the only one on the street in high heels. Flat, they've already figured out that... Uh, High heels are for flat land, and flats are for the hill country. So how does this relate to you? Well, first of all, if you get a call back to San Francisco, you know not to wear the high heels. I've warned you. Second, everybody feels like a stranger in a strange land some days. Some of you are no doubt bursting with excitement and confidence. You can't wait to hit the books, join a journal, challenge your law professors, do an intellectual duel. But I'm willing to bet that most of you feel a lot like I did on that street in San Francisco. Awkward, self-conscious, a bit unsteady on your feet, tilting precariously on the brink of tumbling down all too fast in a direction you're not quite sure you want to go. At least that's the way I felt when I was sitting somewhere right about over there. And actually, I remember this really bit vividly, and I was recalling this morning that one thing I don't remember about this day is the orientation speaker, which gives me some comfort, actually, <laughs> if it weren't for the video camera in the back, in the back there. But, um, but, but that's the way I felt when I was sitting in your, in your seats. I didn't get my undergraduate degree at an Ivy League. 
Um, I had never worked at a law firm or even had life experiences that were in any way remarkable. I certainly wasn't an Abercrombie and Fitch model. <laughs> you probably need to say that. As for employ- employment experience, I had been a lifeguard, a bank teller, and my crowning achievement the summer before law school, a camp counselor. And my numbers weren't that great. They certainly weren't as great as yours. Boy, nobody told me before they asked me to speak that I was going to be speaking to the most qualified <laughs> class in law school history if I, as if I weren't intimidated enough. Um, but, but I knew that my numbers weren't that great because the law school actually published this little chart. And maybe you've seen it. I don't know if they still do it. But you, they put your GPA on the x-axis and your LSAT score on the y-axis. And you can kind of plot it out and see where you stand in the admission pool. Um, and to paraphrase um, broadly, the admissions magazine, the categories were yes, maybe, and don't bother. My scores fell somewhere between maybe and don't bother. I wasn't even any good at softball. (laughs) In short, I was terribly intimidated by the people sitting right next to me. But the admissions officers had found something in my application that made me a good fit for this law school, just as they did in yours. And they know what they are doing. Since 1819, the law school has, graduate, has produced graduates that have gone on to practice in the country's top law firms and to be leaders in government and in the private sector. As Charles Hamilton Houston said, a lawyer is either a social engineer or a parasite on society. Lawyers are easy to blame, and as we've heard earlier this morning, often the butt of jokes, but they are also responsible for many of the positive change we, changes we have seen throughout history. And I'm here to tell you that so are law students. Over the last five years that I've been working with law students, I have seen them accomplish extraordinary things. They have published a report on juvenile reentry that is still cited by various commissions in Virginia today. That was six years ago. They've written the Virginia chapter in a national ABA report that's soon to be published on juvenile collateral consequences. They launched a successful campaign to get the state to clamp down on abusive and unconstitutional school fees, filed a habeas petition on behalf of a young man who was wrongly placed on the sex offender registry for life, and much more. You too will get a chance to do these things. In preparation for today, I listened to some of the previous orientation speakers. Two years ago, Fourth Circuit Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson said something about risk-taking that I really liked, and I saw no reason not to share his wisdom with this class as well. He encouraged your predecessors to risk rejection and disagreement, and he said, all successful lives are strewn with disappointment and rejection. I found what he said about risk-taking so compelling that I thought I'd make it the theme of this speech. You can't be successful here or really anywhere without taking reasonable risks. You've already taken risks to be here. You've taken a risk with your student loans. You've taken a risk that the practice of law will be a fulfilling and rewarding career for you. You've taken a risk that you'll like UVA in Charlottesville. Now let me tell you why your risk was a very reasonable one. You've landed at one of the best law schools in the country, and for the next three years, you'll get to live in one of the best country's best places to live. UVA has something in the curriculum for everyone. If you came to law school to go into public service or government, you've already made a great decision. There is no, no dearth of public service opportunities when I was here, but the law school has made tremendous strides since then with the public interest law program, the new and greatly improved loan forgiveness program, the Powell Fellowship, countless opportunities to partner with law professors or attorneys in the community on a pro bono project, and PILA scholarships for summer uh, public service work. If you came to law school to be an academic, you're in luck as well. There are lots of opportunities to publish a note in one of the student journals. Many students will eventually go on, as Dean Mahoney said, to be adjuncts or to teach full time. And four UVA grads not, f- grads, not fewer than four, are currently or in the past term clerked for the Supreme Court, which is an incredible honor. 
If you came to law school for business, you've obviously heard about the law and business program, the law school's partnership with Darden, the JD MBA program, and UVA's fabulous reputation among uh, some of the biggest and most prestigious law firms. And if you came, how, came to law school to learn how to practice law, don't miss the clinical offerings. Maybe I'm a little bit biased, but there are a number of clinics that are run in partnership with my employer, the Legal Aid Justice Center, as well as others like the Innocence Project, International Human Rights, and the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic that are run in-house. I think, as I said, I'm a little biased since I, t I teach in a clinic, um, but I think once you've mastered thinking like a lawyer, clinics give you a chance to feel like a lawyer. There was one thing that surprised me when I first started practicing law. It was how it felt to have all the power and responsibility of protecting the client's future. Whether the client is a child or a corporation, they've retained you to find them safe passage through dangerous or uncertain waters. Clinics are where you get to see how the law impacts lives. How whether the law says may or shall enroll can determine whether a foster child gets to stay in her home school when she's removed from her home. How saying, I quit, before the employer says, you're fired, could mean forfeiting unemployment benefits that a family could live on. The law has consequences, some of them intended and some of them not, and clinics are wh where you get to see all of them in living color. So now we know you're able to take reasonable risks but don't get too comfortable. In order to get the most out of your tenure here, you have to keep taking risk. It, start with choosing your, it starts with choosing your classes. I'd like to suggest to you that you take the classes and the professors that interest you and that you believe will provide you with relevant skills. Note that the modern legal market is calling not just for legal skills, but for new skills that aren't totally related to traditional law at all. Quantitative methods I mentioned, accounting, finance, negotiation, lobbying, communications, and more. And they are all offered here. Don't be tempted to take something just because it's on the bar. In fact, let this be the last time you even think about the bar until your final semester. Just put it out of your heads until May 2013. It seems like a long time from now. Then and only then you can start worrying. But instead, take the professors and the courses that really intrigue you. Take risks in the classroom. UVA attracts celebrity professors, it's true. If you're like me, you'll be a little bit in all of them every day. You'll hear them on NPR, you'll see them quoted in the New York Times, you'll watch them testifying before Congress. <laughs> you won't want to embarrass them yourself in front of them or your classmates. But realize, that law professors are like wild animals. They're just as scared of you as you are of them. <laughs> okay, that's somewhat of an exaggeration. But in my teaching experience, I am constantly questioning whether I've presented the material clearly. Have I organized the lecture in the right way? Are people afraid to answer because the question was too hard or because it was too easy? Um, your professors are there to challenge you, but more than that, they are there to make sure you get it. And don't be afraid to tell them when you're not getting it or when you disagree. Be comfortable with uncertainty. In the coming weeks, you will have epiphanies. You will be surprised by a new idea, a new way of thinking about things. But just as often, you will be frustrated by the endless hypotheticals and the elusive answers You'll want your professors to just get to the punchline, to tell you the right answer and move on. But if there were easy answers, we wouldn't need lawyers. We would just need search engines. We, lawyers argue, defend, urge, critique, justify, question. That's what they pay us to do. Lawyers make the most of the gray areas in the law, or the gaps, as Dean Mahoney put it. That's what they mean by thinking like a lawyer, and that's what law school trains you to do. Take risks on people. Of all of UVA's attributes, perhaps the most important is the quality of its students. 
The friendships you make here will last you a lifetime. Take some time to get to know not just the people in your section, but the transfer students and the LLMs as well. The students in the Master of Laws program come from all over the world, and the transfers bring a new and valuable perspective to law school having studied and learned the ropes already. Take risks on befriending people with different perspectives from you. You'll see them again. One of my former law school classmates happens to represent most of the school boards in Virginia, which means he is my adversary in most of my cases. I truly believe that the rapport we have established as professionals started when we were students and means that we are able to work through our clients' conflicts toward a resolution that makes the most for for both of them or meets both of their needs to the extent that is possible. Don't miss the opportunity to get to know the faculty while you're here. Take them out to lunch, offer to babysit, challenge them to a game of tennis, visit their office hours, whatever it takes to create a relationship. I count some of my former law professors among my closest friends and confidants. Take the rather insignificant risk of traveling beyond North Grounds. The biggest mistake you can make in law school is to spend too much time at the law school. Charlottesville has so much to offer. If you like art, don't miss First Fridays, the UVA Art Museum, and the Artisan Studio Tour in the fall. If you like music, don't miss Fridays After Five, the Jefferson Theater, the Downtown Amphitheater, and all the small venues around town where, that are just pulsing with the musicians you've heard of and many you haven't. If you like outdoor sports, don't miss cycling on the Blue Ridge Parkway, running the Ravana Trail, mountain biking at Walnut Creek Park, or canoeing down the James. You may even be in luck if you like snow sports. Last year, the big snowstorms turned Charlottesville's main streets into cross-country country ski tracks, and we actually skied all around town. In short, don't miss out on Charlottesville. Take risks in your career. Your job over the next three years is to decide what you want to do and then figure out how to do it. You have the priceless luxury of being able to take risks. When I think about the biggest difference between me and my clients, all low-income children and families, it's not what you think. It's not work ethic. It's not intelligence. It's the ability to take risks. It's knowing that if I fall, I'll have a soft landing. For example, my husband and I are both working at what we love. He's a self-employed woodworker and I'm a legal aid attorney. There is nothing else we would rather do. We can do that because we have the luxury of taking risks. If his business venture doesn't work out, we won't be on the street. He has other skills. If I can't make ends meet at legal aid, I can always get a different job. And that's because me, my husband and I have two, the two most important protective fa factors, strong, stable, and supportive families and education. My clients, on the other hand, don't have the luxury of taking risks. And that's because they don't have the supports in place that most of us take for granted. It's a common cliche to say kids grow up too fast. Well, I'm here to tell you that the kids we serve at Just Children grow up even faster. I read recently that in today's world, the average age of financial independence is 26. It's much lower for, our, for the youth we serve. They can be tried as adults as early as age 13 or 14. They can be terminated from foster care as young as 18, or if they're lucky, 21. They drop out of school to get jobs to help support their families. They are called upon as teenagers to supervise and provide care for their younger siblings, or they become parents themselves. By 26, our clients are practically middle-aged. All of this while neuroscience is telling us that the frontal lobe of the brain is not fully developed until a person's mid-20s. This is the portion of the brain that controls reasoning, impulse control, and long-term decision-making. If you ever thought that teenagers were out of their minds, you were right. They literally are. How many of you have ever been 14? <laughs> come on, come on. How many of you would like to be held responsible for what you did when you were 14? No one would. But that's what 
That's what happens when you are forced to make adult decisions with an adolescent brain. The children and families we represent at Legal Aid do not have the luxury to take risks. You do. No matter where you come from, you will always have the ability to strive for things that are just out of reach. You may not get what you want every time, but you'll always land softly on your law degree. It's a good thing to have. Take risks to pursue justice and fairness, even when it is unpopular. As I mentioned, I just came back from the ABA conference in San Francisco. What I saw there was very inspiring. Lawyers engaged in extremely high-level debate and public debate about very current and contentious issues. Arizona's immigration law, gay marriage, the collateral consequences of juvenile delinquency, to name a few. It was very inspiring to see lawyers on the front lines of these debates. Not just high-level politicians or jurists or academics, but everyday lawyers, and in fact, young lawyers, the Young Lawyers Division, speaking passionately, intelligently, and openly about issues that matter to them. This is the community you are about to enter. So by all means, take risks. But above all, don't take risks with people's futures. Remember that the lawyer serves the client and not the other way around. A law degree is a powerful thing, but like all powerful things, a law degree can be used as a shield and a sword, and it's not a fair fight if both sides are not armed. There is no right to a lawyer in most civil cases. On a daily basis, people stand up on their own in court to save their families from eviction, to defend themselves from creditors, to keep their wages from being garnished. For families living on the financial edge, the loss of a job or housing can be a deprivation of liberty, no less severe or significant than imprisonment. If you ever wonder whether lawyers are worth their hourly rates, spend a morning at the courthouse watching folks go head without lawyers who can't afford lawyers go head to head with those who can. Then you'll know how much a lawyer is worth. So handle your legal education carefully. Becoming a lawyer is a great privilege and a great responsibility. And if at any time in the next few semesters you feel like your risk on law school hasn't paid off, that the practice of law isn't for you, that's okay. There are many worthy things you can do with a law degree that are outside of the traditional legal career. I was reminded recently by John Jackson, who is a civil rights lawyer who's much wiser than I am, that some of the most heroic people in history are non-practicing lawyers. Nelson Mandela is a lawyer, but he didn't free South Africa from apartheid by invoking the courts. Mahatma Gandhi was a lawyer, but he didn't free India from colonialism by asserting legal structures. Nevertheless, I have no doubt that the process of becoming lawyers helped mold and guide their thinking about what justice really is. So the gist of it all is this. Don't be afraid to take risks except where it comes to your clients. And one of the most important risks to take right now is to enjoy law school. Don't think of it as a stepping stone, but as a moment in, in real time to have real fun. Believe it or not, you will. Congratulations and best of luck.